So we're going to speak about the mastoid portion of the temporal bone here. So this mastoid portion is going to form the posterior part of the lateral surface of the temporal bone. So you can see it both externally here and also internally here. From its internal view, you can see the petrous portion, which is going to extend laterally from the anterior surface of the um, mastoid portion. Um, and that's why sometimes this is described as a single petromastoid portion, because it can morphologically look very, very similar. But for the point of this website and video, they're going to be described separately as the mastoid portion and the petrous portion. So back to the external view. It's going to articulate within the skull. Superiorly here, it will articulate with the mastoid angle of the parietal bone and inferiorly here, it will articulate with the inferior border of occipital bone. As you can see here, its external surface is quite rough, particularly um, compared to the squamous portion, which is quite smooth. Um, and that's because there's a lot of muscular attachments here. So it's an attachment site for uh, the occipital belly of occipital frontalis. So that's one of the muscles of facial expression. And it's going to draw the scalp backwards to raise the eyebrows and wrinkle the forehead. Posteriorly. Um, it's going to be an attachment site for auriculus posterior. So if you think of it, just the name auriculus would um, be associated with the ear posterior, um, meaning that it's, although it gives very, very little action, it can draw the auricle backwards. It's also got grooves on the external surface. So you can see here from a more inferior view, this small part here is called the occipital groove and that's going to be where the occipital artery runs. And then internally, here, there's a very deep, deep groove for the sigmoid venous sinus of the brain. So the sigmoid venous sinus is going to be situated within the dura mater on either side and it receives blood from the posterior dural venous sinus. So it's going to be important for venous drainage of the brain. Um, a very important part as well is the mastoid process here. So you can see it very obviously sticking out and this is the part that you can feel or palpate on yourself. Just located kind of behind the lo uh, lobe of the ear. So this part here is going to consist of trabecular bone which is um, filled with air filled cavities which are known as the mastoid air cells. So this is a very important system. And the air cells vary in size and shape throughout it. So in its most superior and anterior regions here, the air cells are the largest and most irregular in shape. And as you follow the process down towards its inferior end here to its apex, they're going to become even smaller. So the most smallest um, air cells will be at its apex. Um, they've got some very interesting functions as well. They're continuous with the middle ear via the mastoid antrum. So the mastoid antrum you can't quite see because it's within the um, mastoid process, but it's up in this region here. And this means that um, they can communicate with the middle and inner ear. And they're thought to protect the inner ear from environmental temperature changes. This is particularly true for the vestibular system, which is highly sensitive to any temperature changes. And it's um, also known that a change in temperature will cause a change in pressure. So the mastoid air system is also believed to regulate that within the middle ear particularly. Um, in males, the mastoid process is larger and that's because there's an abundance of um, muscles attached to it. And in males, these muscles are um, most, most likely larger and would cause um, a pull on the, the process to make it a lot bigger than females. Um, so muscular attachments at this process include sternocleidomastoid. So that's a really important muscle that's going to attach here and it will flex the neck to the ipsilateral side, which is the same side as the muscle. And it will also rotate the head to the contralateral side. So it would cause, the muscle here would cause contralateral rotation, which is rotation to the other side. If both sternocleidomastoids contract, that will also flex the neck and extend the head. Another muscle that attaches here is splenius capitis, which is an intrinsic muscle of the back, and it's deep to sternocleidomastoid that I just spoke about. 
Um, Splenius cavitus is going to support the head in an anatomical position, but it's also a prime mover for head extension and it also allows other movements such as lateral flexion and rotation of the cervical spine to the ipsilateral side, so the same side again. It also here, the mastoid process is going to be an attachment site for longissimus capitis. Um, this is another muscle of the back which is going to allow the extension of the head and cervical spine as well as lateral rotation of the head. Medially, so that's here, initially deep groove that you can see is going to be insertion for the posterior belly of digastric and that inserts in the mastoid notch which is a really really obvious part just um, in between the mastoid process and the occipital groove here. Um, posterior belly of digastric is one of the suprahyoid muscles so that's going to depress and ret retract the mandible and elevate the hyoid bone. So this is going to be important during many actions just like opening your mouth or swallowing or speaking which I'm doing a lot of just now. Thank you.